and the winner of the fiction magazine of the year is Nightmare Magazine. And we have Wendy Wagner here. Wendy, how are you doing? Great. I am beyond excited about this. It's um, it's just such an amazing honor and a delight. It's so exciting. <laughs> Yeah, and it, this is two years in a row that you've done this now. So that <laughs> you know, that is a double achievement right there. It's yeah, what a wonderful surprise. Um I just feel like we've had a lot of luck getting to find and work with terrific writers and I'm so happy that we found stories that have resonated so much with the horror community. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as as everyone knows, we are a little late recording the This Is Horror 2021 awards, so this may be a difficult question given we're now in 2023, but if you can recall, what do you think some of the highlights were for you in 2021? <laughs> Well, uh, two of the biggest highlights were, um, you know, in, in my first issue of 2021 in February, we ran a, a story um, by E.A. Petraconi called, uh, oh my gosh, the title just blanks in my head. It, it's like the girls the world forgot or something kind of like that. And it's a story about like the ghosts of all these victims of uh, some serial killers. And it was just such a horrible, beautiful, thought-provoking story, and people responded to it so passionately. It, it won um, the Shirley Jackson Award for Novelette, and it was just really great. And and E.A. Petraconi hadn't been published in very many locations before this, and so they were just like so excited to get their work out in the world. And getting to work with new writers is an absolute joy and so fun and exciting and that that was just amazing um and then the other big highlight of the year was we ran an extremely fun story uh by gordon b white and the story is called it's it's meant to look like a patreon page right mm. um well sort of inspired by patreon and it's called gordon b white is creating haunted horror and so it's like somebody has subscribed to a patreon page and they get these postcards and terrible things happen and it was just so meta and it was also fun because the story started out as um as flash fiction it was a, quite a bit shorter when he sent it and i felt like it could just be like it, it ha already had quite the scary premise. And I said, hey, Gordon, do you think you could make this a little longer? Because I feel like we deserve to be scared here in this environment a little bit longer. And he was like, okay, whatever. And then he was like, <laughs> I had so much fun making it longer. And then, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a real hit. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, of course, we are very aware that Nightmare always has a fantastic diversity of voices and highlights those from, well, from across the gamut, from all spectrums. But something you have, of course, highlighted here, and I wanted to bring up, is that you also publish a diversity of form. You're not afraid to take something a little bit experimental or uh, unconventional and so I mean a few things that came to mind because I've of course been really focusing in on the 2021 <laughs> fiction in preparation for this is you've got let's see there's taking control of your life in five easy steps by P.H. Lee and this takes the form of a self-help article now I should note a self-help article that if you were to take literally, you would probably go insane, but that <laughs> is a fantastic piece. You've also got Darkness Metastatic by Sam J. Miller, where there are all sorts of different forms within that story. So 
we've got a screenplay, for example, and it also, I mean, it includes a pitch email and document, and that, that story is actually one of my favorites of the of the 2021 year. I mean, there's so many to choose from, but I mean, in terms of these like experimental forms, is that something you're actively seeking out or is it more that people are just Definitely. submitting it because they know that nightmare a game for anything? Uh, I think part of our identity has become exploring different ways of playing around with telling story. Uh, back in, I think, 2018, you know, we had a story that was told as um, like an annotated bibliography, right? And uh, and that was such an unusual piece. But the writer found a way to make what would normally be this incredibly dry and dusty scholarly piece, like chunk of information, tell a story. And that was such a neat challenge, you know, and I thought that was terrific. And so that that is a big inspiration to me. Um, a piece we had in 2021 by um, N. G. Oh my gosh, I should have prepared better for this. I uh, it was all told in in like it was like a, an article in a catalog for an, an mm. art display, an art show, and then it has all these different footnotes that tell like sort of this much creepier story about the artwork and I felt like that was a completely fun and original way to tell a story that only that writer could could have come up with because I do have this art history background and that's so that's something I'm always really looking for in the fiction is finding a story that nobody else could have written it's like unique to that particular writer and it feels fresh and exciting because of that. And yeah, if it can do something weird and fun, so much the better. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I mean, of course, you've also got experimentation in terms of parody and pastiche. And one story that I'm thinking of, and I may absolutely butcher this author's name so apologies in advance to them but we've got sometimes boys don't know maybe by donye Cole. oh my god i yes. got it right i i, I have a history <laughs> of like really badly pronouncing names so okay i'm great so that's by donye coles and that of course takes the idea, and I think everyone knows what I'm about to talk about, where you've got men not only writing bad sex scenes, but writing badly about the anatomy of women. <laughs> and so here we've got this story where it, you know, it's a parody of a girl who is completely comically enamored by a boy that she's just met. And... I'm I'm going to read some lines from, from it. This is a hilarious story. It's so easy to say yes. I want to say yes to everything he asks. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that bit I love. And then this is shortly before it goes full on crazy. He turns into an alley, leads me into an abandoned building. Do you live here? I ask. What a stupid question. Of course he doesn't. I know that. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's just such a brilliant story. And I just realized that I'm not sure that there's a question attached to this. I just wanted to tell <laughs> everyone what a damn good story it is. <laughs> Wasn't that fun? I feel like that character, I mean, first of all, we've all been there when you like meet someone and you're smitten with them and you just can't stop saying like really dumb things and putting yeah. your foot in your mouth but also this character does have like this delightful naivete and to see how that kind of blows up at the end of the story winds up being um a hilarious 
and gross and delightful treat. Mm. Yes, yes. People just need to read it. And it it is another flash fiction piece, so they can read it very quickly. So there's absolutely no excuses for not checking that one out. And exactly. I mean, yeah, talking about flash fiction, I know that when we were speaking with you and John Joseph Adams last year, or probably more like one and a half years ago at this point, yeah, you, know, you were talking about the importance of including more flash fiction. So I'm wondering, what do you think it is that makes it such a wonderful vehicle for storytelling and particularly for horror? Well, I feel like, I feel like horror when it's distilled into a tiny little capsule, um, you know, it's just like a punch right in your brain. And it's, uh, I just feel like that tiny size can really impact you in a way that is outsized for the number of words. I've always felt uh, that horror shorts and the shorter the horror story, the more interesting it can be. Like as a as a young person, I loved reading short horror stories. I loved like Stephen King short stories, but I didn't really like short stories um, after I, I like as I got older and started reading more like literary fiction, it felt like, oh, short fiction is something you're supposed to read. And I what got me back into short stories was like discovering like short story horror anthologies and just realizing like you could have just these tiny little horrible bonbons and like I think there's kind of almost a game and seeing like how much can be done in so little space. That's another reason why we started running poetry as well. Mm. Um, I think it's fun to have like a variety of textures and sizes in the magazine. It keeps, it makes each issue have just like a, a more interesting shape i think it's nice to have like a a much longer story and then followed by like a little poem um i just feel like your reading pattern if you're shaking it up it can make things uh have like a different kind of impact and you can be you can, you can access more feelings um without being so stuck in a rut or, or mm. you know, you've got to have like different rhythms and textures to keep it fun. Yeah. And I think having all these different types of writing, I mean, it can create as well a kind of choose your own adventure for the reader. And obviously, depending on my mood and also time constraints, that there are going to be times where I want a poem, when I want a longer piece of fiction when I want to read one of the non-fiction pieces so in giving us such a broad range we we can dip in and out depending on our mood so I think that is a fantastic highlight of Nightmare I mean it's been voted fiction magazine of the year for a damn good reason so there it is <laughs> Yay, I'm so glad that you like having all those different sizes and, and different categories to pick and choose from. Yeah, I like to think there's like a little bit of something for everybody, you know, like some people do love like having the opportunity to read that nonfiction. And some people just really want to read like long stories. And sometimes people want everything. And yeah, I just I love knowing that we're like serving up a bunch of different flavors for people. Mm. And I mean, of course, the H word is a fantastic nonfiction column that you put out every month. And I think these pieces are amongst the most important articles for horror writers today. And there's always so much to ponder. I mean, 
one of the articles from December 2021 is ambiguity. What does it mean by Simon Stranzes? And I mean, this idea of suggestion, of implying, but not necessarily naming terrible events or things. And I mean, in terms of ambiguity and horror, what are some of your favorite books or stories or films that play around with this? I think a good example that I think might actually be from 2021 is um, Ronald Malphite's Come With Me, mm. uh, which was a, a great novel featuring uh, ghostly things. And it a lot gets revealed at the end, but you're sort of like in a very nebulous and gray zone throughout the midpoint of the novel uh, where you're trying to figure out the backstory of this man or this man's like missing wife and or I guess she's not missing she's dead um and then you, there are like mystery elements and that aspect of ambiguity is such a wonderful driver for the mystery and also because there are so many ambiguous things um you don't quite ever feel like you quite have your footing you're very like is this supernatural is this mental is this other stuff and it makes when horrible things happen it makes it particularly um exciting and confusing and difficult and i thought that the way that he used ambiguity in that work was extremely successful um yeah Definitely one of my favorite reads from that year, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely up mm -hmm. there with the best of them. Just checking that Bob didn't want to <laughs> jump in. I had a little little noise of approval, that's... but that, that's just that's just the classic Melfi approval noise, evidently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, the, the article <clears throat> is, is probably one of my favorites of, the, of that year because I, I'm real into ambiguity and especially, you know, coming from Simon who um, is, you know, probably one of the, you know, forefront writers uh, of our generation, especially when it comes to ambiguity. Uh, it was very interesting, his take on it. And um, it, it's, it's one of those things that when you, I, I, I strive to read it, you know, in, in a story. I'm really, I'm like every story I approach it, like, man, I hope there's a, lo a level of ambiguity here. Uh, because to me, that only increases the, the, the tension. It, 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 is this real? Is this not real? Is this, you know, a combination of both? And those, those kind of feelings that to me, that, kind of it mirrors our real world in, in, in a lot of ways. We, we encounter things in the real world that we're like maybe confused about or something. And, and it's like, is this, is this really happening? Is this how things really are? And I think it's a good reflection, you know, and of course, like what Simon says, you know, horror is, is, is you know, is, is a lens that we view the world from. And I think ambiguity can be also part of that lens or at least a shade of that lens. I feel like the vast majority of other writing isn't as committed to using ambiguity as horror is. And for our genre, it's such a powerful tool. And it's, it's part of the reason why there's so much, you know, just weird stuff in horror, because being in an ambiguous situation or being in a situation that feels weird or off is it's so unsettling and uncomfortable. I think, you know, that uncomfortable is kind of what horror does best. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we find comfort in the uncomfortable that is um, using the, the, you know, one word and it's twice in a sentence, but in totally different ways. And uh, we, we find comfort in being disturbed. And uh, when that ambiguity starts, it, it's like there's a slip 
in in the reality and it's it's like when i when i encounter it it's 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 the coolest stuff i love it i agree me too and another h word column that i wanted to highlight is better living through horror by donald mccarthy and i wanted to ask you as this is really what the column focuses on but how do you think your life is better because of horror fiction uh so i'm gonna uh, rewind a little bit and in 2017 uh, you know it, it, i had a lot of depression for a lot of different reasons it was a very difficult year for me and i kind of just felt a little bit unplugged from the world and I, I wasn't functioning super great and we got this video game that a friend lent us it was called until dawn i don't know if you are video gamers but it's that oh, terrific yeah, I've little played horror it. game yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is full of jump scares and mm. uh really scary stuff and I started playing it and it was like I when I was playing it I just felt so alive again and mm. I felt like afterward that it had recharged me somehow and I just felt so much better about being alive than I did before I started playing that game and it just seemed to me that when we confront really awful stuff in the form of fiction and, and you know, whether that fiction is, is video games or whatever media it's in, it is good for us, you know? Yeah. And I, after that, I just really became committed to, yeah, better living through horror. I, you know, I, I started writing horror and spending more focusing more on on editing horror and just being more with uh, involved with the horror community because i just think we live in a society that will often discourage us from being scared we have uh we often have very comfortable lives uh things uh you know we 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 do our best not to be scared, not to be uncomfortable. And uh, I don't know that that's very good for us. And I feel like horror is a great way to practice being scared or practice being in unpleasant situations. And I, I'm just a huge advocate for it. Yeah. Yeah. And what an underappreciated game as well until dawn mm -hmm. <laughs> i need oh. to replay it now and it's the kind of game where of course there are various storylines so it is well worth replaying several times yeah i agree i would think uh i keep thinking i might do it but i heard the same team put together a new game called the query that came out maybe either last year or the year before and it is very similar in the writing tone and the use of motion capture and people say it's very 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 fun <laughs> and very very scary oh. well there is another purchase that one must have slipped under <laughs> my radar i wasn't even aware of it but i appreciate I hadn't you heard about it <laughs> yeah that's the one with uh with ted rainey's in that or his right, yeah. motion capture and his voice is in there yeah 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 Damn. So, yeah, I haven't played it, but I've seen I've seen some some gameplay of it. It looks fun. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so many good games that I haven't played yet. Because I mean, when I was young younger, I was playing a lot more games. But then, I guess like as happens, like when you're taking your writing more seriously, and there's the podcast, there's editing. It kind of means yes. that having time to play video games is is more of a premium but i mean the good thing about that is it makes every video game feel like it's a lot better value for money 
because I remember when the original Resident Evil 2 came out, and in the UK that was £60. So, you know, I, I guess it was getting on for $100. And then I just blitzed through the entire thing in a weekend. And oh, wow. <laughs> it just felt like, oh, God, that that's that then. But whereas now, I mean... I bought The Last of Us Part 2 whenever the hell that came out. And then maybe periodically every month or two, I'll play about half an hour or an hour. And so it's like, wow, this is really good value. This has lasted years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh. Ad admittedly, Resident Evil Village came out, which then meant that The Last of Us 2 had to pause because any Resident Evil or Silent Hill that's it it becomes the priority <laughs> i just I, I i'm not sure well, what would i do if i was playing a resident evil and then a silent hill came out that would be the quandary for me but it hasn't happened mm. yet and yeah <laughs> oh, well let me tell you brace yourself the the last the last bit of the last of us two is pretty gripping stuff yeah i would say it's one of the most emotionally devastating pieces of fiction i have ever engaged with i mean yeah it's not quite as like, bad as a painted bird by ted kizimski that's still not ted kizimski jersey but uh it's right up there <laughs> yeah <laughs> but bob's face when you said ted <laughs> Yeah, I get no, a lot of now value I out just... of games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say I get a lot of value out of games because I suck as a game player so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, you, you, I mean, it's like I have you know, uh, and the game it never fails. The game saves when I have no ammo and no and no health. So I come yeah. back, and it's it's a, it's a struggle just to stay alive. You know, yes, and then it never, it never fails. That that's that's my and that if it was any other way, I'd probably be disappointed. <laughs> you know, because that's what makes it fun. <laughs> it's like trying to figure out how to how to just survive. It's like, man, if I get hit one time, I'm dead. <laughs> I've got to run. <laughs> I can't run here. It's just a, you know, you just a madcap thing. And friends watching me play, they're like going, "Man, you are terrible. You are absolutely <laughs> terrible." I'm like, "But I love playing." <laughs> As long as you love it, it doesn't matter if you're good, right? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you've achieved so much with Nightmare in the past couple of years. What are your plans going forward? And what kind of things do you want to achieve and to do to take it to the next level, whatever Im amazing <laughs> horror level that might be that I can't even conceive of? Oh, gosh, that's a tough question, right? Like, you always want to kind of one up yourself. But um, we have some fun surprises coming up this year, I think. Uh, you know, I've been sort of organizing our issues around themes. Um, it didn't really mean to happen, but it just seemed like I'd look at like the stack of stories that I bought and I was like, oh, these all have something in common. Let's just group them together. Uh, so we will have some themed issues. Uh, one in August this year that might be linked to someone well known in our field who has a birthday that month. Um, and then we also, on top of publishing um, horror at Nightmare, we also publish dark fantasy. And it's always exciting to try to figure out like where the boundary is on those world mm. and, and, and how they cross over and things. So I think we'll be doing something in the fall that maybe really explores dark fantasy um, a little bit more richly. Uh, and hopefully that will be fun. So those are some fun things we have coming up this year. <laughs> All right. Sounds fantastic. And of course, a lot of people listening are also writers, so I would be remiss if I were not to ask, first of all, 
when submissions are open for Nightmare Magazine? And also, do you have any tips or words of advice for those looking to submit to Nightmare Magazine? Uh, well, I think I have been moving extremely slowly through submissions lately. Uh, in part, like life has just been extra hectic and, um, but also, you know, trying to make some decisions about making some fun stuff happen at the magazine. So I'm actually not going to open again the submissions until fall, I think. Um, so like September will open again. And of course, um, you know, some of the things we've talked about in this podcast about exploring fun structures or writing that has really fun characters, um, just sort of like weird, wild and unique flavored stuff is probably uh, what we're usually looking for. So um, yeah, if you are a writer and you're thinking about submitting when we reopen in the fall, think about that. <laughs> all right well thank you so much for joining us and again a huge congratulations on winning fiction magazine of the year oh thank you so much so fun to come and talk to you and thanks for running these wonderful awards that just you know really help us all talk more about this terrific genre that we work in Mm -hmm.